Hi, Dan. Gretchen's here. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm on my iPad. I don't know if I can unmute and mute as easily as I could on the laptop, but no. Well, we're, we're ready for all technical difficulties tonight. Just don't start screaming at your daughter and we'll be okay. <laughs> Anyone you guys know out running the road race tonight? Oh, is that tonight? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't know. It doesn't go by my house anymore. Oh, it doesn't go by there? Nope. It used you know, to, it, didn't it? It did, and but now every every half marathon in the city goes by, but uh, not uh, no more Yankee homecoming because there's a mile of nothing that they really didn't like. A mile of of heat, of and heat. Nobody cheering. No water. No nothing. And they yeah, decided, but that'd be better than running on Story Ave, wouldn't it? Uh, I Way guess. Way better. But, I think it's nice and shady on the Hale Street. I'm surprised they didn't keep that part of the route. So David's not going to be here. Right. Um, That's it. But hopefully Charlie and Carol will show. Otherwise, we do go home early. Rather not do that. Oh, Charles, Charlie's here, but he's a, he's oh, in the yeah, attendee list. So I'm going to, Charlie, I'm about to move you over to be a panelist, promote you to panelist. Oops. Got to open that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Charlie. Charlie. All right, we have a, uh, a quorum. Sorry, guys, just going forward in terms of the, the link to join the meeting, which one should we be using? Yep. Um, did Andy Port send you an email with what's called a panelist link? I probably have it. I've just been joining the wrong one, I'm sure. If you if you can't find it, then um, let me know and Andy will send you another invite to be a panelist. And then okay. every, every single meeting you use the panelist link. Um, okay. And everybody else uses the link on the website and on the agenda and all that. Charlie, what I do is I, uh, I, my uh, reminder for the meeting, I put in the, the link, put that link in. Good idea, yeah. We'll do that here. All right. Um, well, we have a whole crew here, or we have as much as we need to have. So let's uh, let's bring this meeting to order. This is the August second, twenty twenty two, Newburyport Conservation Commission meeting, taking place on the Zoom platform. This meeting is being recorded, um, and our first item on the agenda are the meeting minutes from July nineteenth, twenty twenty two. Do we have any uh, changes or corrections? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, roll call. Uh, Charlie Olovacetti. Uh, Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. And I vote yes. All right, next item are the, uh, uh, any Plum Island updates, Julie? Um, the only Plum Island update I have is that last week, the um, Army Corps of Engineers awarded the contract for the dredge of the Merrimack River, which means, and I'm not sure the name of the company or for how much, but that means that they are still on target to start the dredge work in mid to late September, which is great. Very That's good. Anybody got any questions? No. All righty. Um, so let's uh, let's move on. Certificates of compliance, regards to determinations, etc. Uh, the first item, the daily group, Pre-Colby Farm Lane. 
181A, 183 Low Street Certificate of Compliance. They have uh, <laughs> requested a another continuance. Do they con want to continue to the next meeting? Sure. Yes. Yep, they do. So that is August 16th. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Your motion. Motion to continue uh, to August 16th. Second. Uh, roll call. Charlie Lovasetti. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Uh, Dan Warshaw. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Next item is uh, Michelle and Vincent McCarty, three to seven Colby Farm Lane. Request for minor modification. Yes. Uh, okay. Just stone. So let me see. Vince, I'm going to move him over to be a panelist so he can speak about this project. It looks like there's a question from Jess Stone. I'm not sure which project that's for. Oh, she took her hand down. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, great. So I'll just give you a brief overview. And then I think um, Vincent is on the line at, from, from 13 Doyle Drive and can explain to you a little bit more about what they want to do. But essentially, this is one of the parcels um, in the three to seven Colby Farm Lane development. And um, the, you know, these homes have been lived in now for quite a while, and some of the homeowners have wanted to do some things on their properties, but because it's still an open order of conditions, they haven't been able to make modifications their backyards or whatever. So um, these homeowners would like to put in a shed, actually they've already put in this shed, and a small plunge pool that you can see right here, and rather than wait for the developer to finish with the certificate of compliance and then come to the commission, for a request, whether that would be like an RDA or a, a maybe even a letter permit, given that these things are relatively minor, um, they are doing it as a minor modification to the open order of conditions for the larger development. Because it's the only way to legally approve, get this approved right now. Um, and they'd like to move forward with the work. So this is a sketch of the pool and the shed, but um, there's also a little bit more work that was done already during construction of their, of their house um, on this property. They did a sunroom and a deck, which is just in a slightly different configuration than what was originally proposed. And this area outlined in purple is a patio. Um, so we asked that they would sketch that on this plan as well so that it all could be approved at the same time as part of this minor modification. And just so you will know also this yellow highlighted line here is the 100 foot buffer zone. So most of this work and with the wetlands being sort of out off to the, off to the side off the property. So most of this work is in the very outer part of the 100 foot buffer zone in area that was um, already manicured and now, I don't know, Vincent, if you want to add any um, additional detail to this or ask me to show any of the photos that you sent. And Vincent, you need to unmute yourself if you want to say something. Hi, can you, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, no, um, it, um, Julie, you said it well. We're just, we're right now, um, Carly, we're looking to just put that, it's a 13 by seven foot plunge pool kind of right there where we marked it on the plan. Um, we did have the shed previously done. We'd, we'd pulled a permit for that um, and that, that was that was accepted last year. So we put that in and we've done, um, we have done some um, pavers in that purple area already. Um, so we're just looking to add in this plunge pool, which is, um, which is about three feet into the ground. So it's not, it's not really a ton of, ton of, ton of space that it's going into, but um, you know, we want to see if that could be approved. There's a photo. Let me try just see if I can find the photos here. Um, oh yeah, here's the patio area coming down off the deck. This is where the pool would go. As you can see that red arrow. Yeah, yeah. it's right in that space. Yeah. So where is this lot in relationship to the <clears throat> the path that goes into the, the rest of the property? So we're, we're, there's actually another home um, 
to uh, it actually there's a plan right there so if you're looking on this plan right here we're lot 11 so so 13 would be with it there's 13 which is our neighbor and then the path is yep. right beyond that okay so, so actually, where right on this, little, uh, yeah this where we're on this are the things you're planning on doing right where What's can that? you see my cursor Steve? yeah yep. that's like right around right there is where the pool the little plunge pool would go am okay. i right Vincent? exactly and then, yep. and then this is sort of like a patio right in this area it comes out around like that and the shed is kind of like right here okay that's exactly right all right um, so I mean, I think this is something that if and it's all these are all sort of like accessory structures to single family homes. They're all they're all allowable under um, even in buffer zone um, under our ordinance. And so and given that these are also in the outer 50 feet of the buffer zone in an area that's already manicured backyard, it's not it's not something that I think um, would have re required um, any sort of major permitting effort. If this were to come in later, so it truly would be a minor modification to the planning. Uh, anybody, anybody got anything? Any questions? Oh, uh, with regards to um, the water in the pool, I don't know how much water is in a plunge pool, but. Um, when you're when you're emptying the pool and when you're maintaining the pool, where's the what's going to happen with the water? Um, so it, uh, first of all, so the it is it's a salt water um, system. Um, uh, if we did take it out, we could we could have it pumped from a um, we we were we were going to have it we we're going to have it filled from a of like a water pool company. Um, I don't think we had a plan in place for draining it. Um, probably would just have a company come and drain it for us because there's really not a lot of area to put it out in that spot. You probably don't even need to drain it. You probably just need to cover it in the winter. Um, maybe it, maybe they get drained a little bit and then um, to cover over and then just open it back. The same pool company might open. Yeah, it. and the, the way these pools work, actually, they're um, the year round. So it's it's a heated it's a heated pool and it has a um an insulated cover for you know for year round to be used so i'm not sure how often we would even have to do much with it unless it was years down the line and we needed maintenance on it but there really wasn't much much really uh to do with it in terms of winterization and stuff okay and you said it was a salt water pool it is yep okay so you, you probably don't want to drain it onto your lawn it's <laughs> no i know <laughs> so well that that's where yeah. where pipes can come in too so yeah i guess that's uh part of uh part of my question but um i would I think that you wouldn't need to drain it really at all but you might need to backwash the filter system every once in a while if it's that kind of a filter system and then you could just put that into a storm drain which would probably be better in case it is the salt water yeah that's probably really all that's really probably the maximum that we need to do with that. Okay. Um, all right. Do we have anything else? I I see just stoners raise their hand again. Um, normally, we don't have uh, any public comment on a a uh, certificate of compliance, but we can see what what Jess has to ask. Go ahead, Jess. Yes, hi, sir. Jessica Stoney, Doyle Drive, Newburyport, Mass, 01950. So my question would be, when we are saying that, like, we don't know where things are going to drain to or that you wouldn't have to drain it, my argument would be, and my concern would be, not so much as to what they're doing, but how it is impacting the homes around them. And considering that there is a lot left unknown, such as perk testing and grade testing and things that are now in superior court, I don't really understand how my house is allowed to literally soak down a street and float away and we have to leave it while somebody else gets to get questions on where things are going to drain and how things are going to work when we have so many things left unanswered by this developer and the people working beneath him. 
Okay. So if um, we don't know where it's going to drain, I feel like that should be brought to the table before anything else on that supposed HOA is approved for anybody else to add anything. I think they should be really going through people that know exact facts. Right. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we ask uh, for people who have pools near uh, wetlands. Um, we, we want uh, some sort of a, a maintenance. We like to know what, what the maintenance uh, plan is just so there right. are you're not dumping water into. Um, Which it would wetland. be hitting my lot. And it's fair to say we haven't lived there anymore. Like I go in and out and leave and our majority of our belongings are in a U box, but I would just please as a favor to these homeowners, I would really caution them as to the rush in this because there is a lot left unchecked. And that's all I have to say. All right, thank you, Jess. Sure thing. I guess I wasn't aware of any issues out there with drainage. Um, we're, we're, there aren't any. We're not having any, to be honest. And and truthfully, our you know we're again we're a lot eleven. She's lot ten. You know what? Uh, even we're not near her. At we're all. not near her at all. I don't know why there would be yeah. concern with that. Yeah, she's yeah. lot ten. She's over here. And I I there there have been I understand the developer and the city have been talking about some drainage issues having to do with this part of the development over here. But like these guys are saying, I don't believe that a plunge pool in the backyard of, of a lot 11 would have any impact whatsoever on that. And we do have an email. Sorry, I'm just chiming in now. But we do have an email from the engineer, the peer engineer, I believe it's called, that it would have no impact on stormwater management and, in fact, improve uh, runoff. Is this Michelle? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we did get an we did get um an email to Phil because Phil Christensen on behalf of the city and the planning board has been reviewing the stormwater um issues on the, for this development. And they've been addressing things with the developer. And I believe they are aware of this pool proposal and the modifications and have not indicated that there are any problems with it. There's yeah, excellent. Excellent. then have at it. All right, thank you. Absolutely. All right, what do we want to do? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the minor modification. Second. My roll call, Charlie Lovisetti. Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. And I vote yes. All righty. I get a motion to open the public hearings. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call, Charlie Lovisetti. Yes. Uh, Steve yes. Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, we're gonna switch tonight. We're gonna do uh, Arthur and Sandy Manley first. Tom has uh, several things he has to get to in Newberry. So we'll, we'll do... Uh, as I said, Arthur and Sandy Manley, 257, 259 Water Street, notice of intent. Yep, get there. Do we have a, uh, a number on this yet? We do, it's 051-1066. And let me see, I need to promote Lisa um, and Tom. Panelists. And Lisa and Tom, you can let me know if there's anyone else who needs to also be a panelist for this. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for uh, accommodating my my scheduling issues. Um, this is Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting here on behalf of um, Arthur and Sandy Manley. Uh, Lisa Mead is with me tonight. Lisa handled the zoning um, and historic applications for this uh, for this property. Um, actually, I'm not sure if it went to zoning, but it went to historic. Um, so the, the, pro the project actually consists of removal from a two-dimensional point of view of footprint through the removal of some decks and uh, an attached shed. 
Um, and then what I call an upward addition is really increased ceiling height within the structure. It's not like an additional floor is being added on. Um, they're actually straightening out uh, some roof lines. They are putting a deck on top of one roof. But um, let's let's start with um, the basics. I think you all know where this is in terms of within the city. Um, it's right near some projects you've reviewed recently. Uh, it's located on Water Street within the historic uh, section of that of that street. Um, the area you can see the it's the smallest house in that picture with the um, I'm sorry the, the one to the right of that it's it's the smallest it's the one to the right and then in the back there is sort of an attached shed uh, and a patio area you can see there's an L-shaped bench on the back of that patio area we are removing that L-shaped bench um, and then we're removing that that shed area um, and if we can um, go to the uh, flood map. So to remind the commission, as I'm sure you're aware, but we do have new members um, since the last Water Street project, the area is mapped within the VE, uh, the velocity zone elevation 15. And um, it, it, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so we were just looking at this. Let's go to uh, the next. This is just a view, uh, again, a view from another angle. And if we can go down now mm -hmm. to uh, the plans. You want okay. these, I'm oh, sorry. Um, and I actually did ahead. receive a set of plans today from the um, from Lisa that, that I didn't have available that actually show existing versus compared on the same sheet, which I'm happy to pull up if I share my screen. But if you take a look on your right, um, the um, you see those sort of roof deck on the right there. That area currently is just a sloped deck. So what happens, or a sloped roof. So what we do is we straighten out the roof and, uh, and put the deck on. And in other areas like down below that top flat roof that you see is a sloping roof in the current situation. There's like windows going on in, in various places, but it's not a it's not a significant, you know, it's an increase in volume rather than an increase in sort of floor area. Um, would be the best way to describe it. If if I Tom, if I could just interrupt yeah. for a second, this is Lisa Mead on behalf of the Manleys. Uh, it actually is an architectural change. Um, the roof is kind of a, a sloped, odd shaped roof. And it merely is a straightening of the roof to become a flat roof. So there is no increase in living area at all. Um, and we can show that when you go down to the next slide, Julia, please. Sorry, the slide One, 44. Yeah. There we go. So currently, if you look at the rear elevation, um, that roof has a, a very odd shape right now. And um, if Tom shows the, the bottom picture of that roof in the rear, has a very odd slope to it, and it merely straightens that roof out. So the upward extension is on the right-hand side of this drawing because that, that roof went down right there, that flat roof went down at an angle. And so it's merely an upward extension because they had to raise the wall on the right-hand side to, um, to bring the, the roof line um, to make it flat roof line. Um, also, I would just note that there are two decks that are on the uh, left side or the west elevation that are also being removed um, that um, I think Tom just forgot to, uh, to tell you. But anyway, I'll turn it back over to you, Tom. Yeah, actually, I, uh, that's on the site plan, Lisa. I thought the site okay. plan was the best way to show that. Um, yeah. So you can see right there um, the proposal, those two beige areas are being removed as well as the um, that area, the porch right down there. So. Um, so we're we're kind of removing a bunch of structure, and as Lisa said, we're, we're the way I think of it, we're we're improving head height within the structure. We're not changing the living area, right? We're we're flattening out the roof a little bit, and they get a roof deck. But um, this is not a significant expansion of structure in any in any way. And we're removing items. We're removing the bench from the patio, and um, and really. The end result is less structure in the floodplain. Um, this is another one where the historic commission has determined that it will retain its historic importance 
after the work is done. And so there's the supremacy issue with the building code and the exemption to the substantial improvement that plays in on it as well. Um, so I think it's a really pretty straightforward project. I think it's sort of the, the easiest of all the projects on Water Street we brought into you to date. Um, and at this point, what I'd like to do is just, you know, put it out to you guys for any questions or uh, um, things you can answer. It, yeah. It, if I can add just a couple of other things. Uh, so currently the, pro the property is a two family property. Um, and so it's gonna be converted to a single family home. Uh, so that's a, a, a reduction in density in the area. Additionally, all of the mechanicals are currently in the basement and they are all gonna be removed up to the second floor above the floodplain. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we added that as well. And so um, I'll turn that, I'll turn it yeah. over. No, thank you. And that that's within my narrative. But the other thing is it's it's not only with it out of the floodplain, but it's out of the floodplain plus the projected right. sea level rise that's in your regulations. So all right. of the utilities, we're, we're making this a more resilient structure to the extent we can within the historic limitations. So just out of curiosity, I'm, this does not to me look like an historical home. What, what, what makes it historical? Sure. Um, so um, Steve, it, it's historical for two reasons. One by age, um, in the city as you report anything that's more than 75 years old, um, and this is uh, actually late 1800s, um, it's historic. And secondly, um, it's part of the Joppa Historic District. And so to remove this home from this area and put it on pilings um, would be a significant damage to the Joppa Historic District. And so the, um, and it's also listed as contributory on the district data sheets. So um, it is historic. Um, the Historic Commission um, determined that it was currently historic and that even after the proposed uh, renovations, uh, which they believed brought some more of the historic detail back uh, to the structure, uh, it will remain historic and remain an important part of the Joppa Historic District. And the ZBA also approved the application. Julie, can you go to uh, page 35 there, that one? Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Oh, okay. All right. Now I understand what you're doing with that roof. So you see the sloped roof there, Joe? Yep. That yep. Now That's now going to be a flat roof. Okay. And this lower area right here, this shed with the flat roof gets removed along with this deck. Right, and, and that entry. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And the bench out around the outside deck closest to the water. There. Right, which does remove a, a vertical element within the floodplain. So, um, I mean, basically, all of the alterations are are reducing impact within the flood, and and we see it as a as a good project. And again, within the um, the context of your land subject to coastal storm flowage regs. Um, I think this is probably the cleanest project we brought you within the Water Street thing, where it's really pretty basic and simple to tell you that we're not having any adverse effect. Um, and with the historic decision, um, you know, the building code has that exemption. So, um, the only comment I had was you're removing those items um, that we talked about, and yet they were going to be replanted with lawn. Yeah. I would like to see some native vegetation, pollinators, whatever, something besides grass. So yeah. so the, the thing is where, if you look at where the removal elements are, they're right up yeah. against the house. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're not really looking to disturb much away from the, from the house. Um, so when you're right up against the house like that, I'm not sure that that we can uh, really add a lot of pollinator value or a lot of native plant value within those footprints where those are coming out. Really? Um, Did you go to the site plan? Shrubs, for you, that you can't. You can't put shrubs up against a house. Well, no, we we can put shrubs ag against a house, right? But but they don't add a lot of when the shrub is right up against the house. You'll get songbirds that would go to like a house feeder, but you don't get you don't get the sort of um, benefit of being right, like connected to the resource area in the way that 
something. Well, so my so my comment, I guess, is also related to Steve's, but less about pollinators um, and more about just roughness of the surface or floodplain issues. Where okay. this is the V zone, so anything that you can have that's not a flat surface is going to be hugely beneficial in terms of breaking up that wave energy as it comes through the in between those structures there. So, um, you know, but removing, removing the decks is a huge benefit, but like adding some roughness value would be even better. Um, so I just, um, I just, given the format that we're at, I've just exchanged texts with, with our clients and they're agreeable to doing um, some shrubs and some native plantings in those areas. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the less lawn, the better. Yeah, I mean, either way, either way, removal of the vertical structure, even to lawn, is a significant benefit. Um, you know, and uh, well, it's a non-issue. I mean, we can look, right. they'll, they'll, they are agreeing to put um, pollinators and shrubs uh, around those areas. Right. right. So, so what we'd yeah. like to do, I guess, is if it's possible, is to get a conditional approval with us submitting a planting plan for those areas that includes pollinators and shrubs. Would that be acceptable to the commission? Sure. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. Okay. And there, there's if if the um, if the applicant would prefer to put those in a different location, that probably would be okay too. I mean, you could put them a little bit further out, closer to the seawall. Maybe that provides them some, um, you know, screening, and and it will help to break up that wave velocity a little bit e even sooner. That. It's something that they might want to consider. So how about if, if the condition were to read of an equivalent um, square footage to the removal of to the removal, removal of structure? Sure. sure. And, then, and then we can work to come up with something that from a landscape point of view actually looks good for, from the single family home point of view, but also provides some function. Yep. OK. OK. And there's no work being done on the seawall or the, the salt marsh on the no. other side. Is that correct? No. no. You don't want to raise the seawall a little bit for. <laughs> well, so so as as I think folks are aware, that seawall was um, enhanced in '78, I believe, by the city with those concrete blocks that run along the top, and that runs the whole historic or most of the historic. Yes section of water. I certainly, from a from an environmental point of view, would love to see something done on the entire length of the wall, but piecemealing it doesn't really make sense. No. So can I, uh, can I just ask you a question? I hate to interrupt, uh, Tom, but um, the Manleys are really trying to get moving on this house because um, they're trying to get it constructed to move into it. So could the condition be that they, um, you know, prior to the issues of the certificate of occupancy, Julia, that they would present to you a planting plan so that they can go ahead and get their building permit and then get it done properly. Yep. Yeah. Great, thank you. Fine by me. Um, we got anything else? Uh, anything from the public? Raise your digital hand if so. Seeing none, um, what do we want to do? Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All right, roll call. Charlie Lovacetti? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. And I vote yes. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, taking me up front, and I appreciate the other applicants' patience. So thank you very much. Sure. Take care. You're welcome. Bye. All right. Next item, City of Newbury Report, 24 Merrimack Street, Notice of Intent. Okay. Um, yeah, we Hi have there. A, a team. Yeah, oh, good. There's Andy. Okay. Uh, sorry, this is Andy Port um, from the Office of Planning and Development. Hopefully, you can all hear me. I'm, uh, I'm remote, obviously, um, but actually, not even on a computer, I'm on a, a phone. So, hopefully, you can all hear me. Yep. Yep. Okay, um, so uh, I'm acting as the city's project manager for this project. It's uh, Market Landing Park expansion. I think you're 
probably all members are probably generically familiar with the project scope. Um, we're looking for a order of conditions for the project. Um, we have Sasaki under design contract uh, to do what we call 100% design plans, which is to have it uh, shovel ready uh, for bid this winter and construction next spring. Um, so we have a couple of folks from Sasaki and from VHB here this evening who are gonna provide an overview of the plans of the project. I'm happy to elaborate uh, on this with them or answer any questions you may have afterwards. Um, but with that, I'd like to pass it on to um, to Marin Braco, uh, Dan Dwyer, uh, who is from, uh, they're from Sasaki. Uh, we also have Steve Engler from, uh, from Sasaki as well. And the primary person presenting tonight will be Laura Lynch. Um, if if uh, she would like to take the screen and uh, show some slides. We're going to walk through the jurisdictional areas and the scope of the project and then uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, we've tried, of course, in this project to address resiliency, so that's covered in our presentation as well. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, Laura, if you if someone wants to share their screen from Sasaki, I will stop sharing and you guys can do that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I'll share my screen. <clears throat> Just let me know when you can see that. Okay, looks good. Great. All right, so uh, I think you you got the full team introduction from Andy. Uh, my name is Laura Leach. I'm from VHB. We have the Sasaki team here as well tonight to walk through this NOI with you. Uh, I think um, I'll start again with uh, just going through what we'd like to present, which is uh, first we'll go through the existing conditions of the site, then the proposed, um, we'll talk through how the design is making the site more climate resilient. Um, we'll talk through the work and then show you how the work is compliant with the regulations, uh, both Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw. And then we will share some of the mitigation measures that we're proposing. So this is the uh, site as it exists today. And um, there are a fair amount of resource areas on the property. Um, the, um, the main thing I'd like to show on this, I mean, we have a, um, a 20, uh, actually, I'll go through each one just so that you're familiar. The, the green at the top is the 25 foot no disturb off the river. The um, <clears throat> yellow here is the uh, 100 foot buffer zone to coastal bank. The um, orange, or sorry, dark orange, is the land subject to coastal storm flowage. And the later orange is the riverfront area. And I think um, what's good to note about this aerial is simply the amount of degraded area that's already on the parcel. It's very disturbed currently and has a lot of impervious surface. And so part of the goal of this project is to really improve what's there today. <clears throat> And here's the proposed plan. And you can see just right away how much more green space is added to um, waterfront green space to this parcel. And um, <clears throat> there, uh, there's a variety of um, access here, access to the docks, uh, gathering space, uh, landscaped areas and uh, recreation that's provided with this project. I think we're going to go into some some detail on all of those features, but this just gives a nice overview. And the first thing that's really striking is um, how much less impervious is um, in the proposed condition. So the um, <clears throat> when we were we were looking at this uh, under a twenty seventy condition, we considered 50 inches of sea level rise. So what you're seeing in that uh, graphic there is the flooded areas that would occur during a 100 year storm event in 2070. And as you can see, most of the property is flooded in some to some extent. So the one of the main goals of the project is to make this 
property more resilient. And um, there are some a variety of constraints here. Um, and so the the grading that is designed is uh, has to tie into existing in places. So the, um, the the proposed grading does avoid tidal flooding areas. Um, it reduces coastal storm flood flooding as well. It doesn't completely eliminate it simply because we do have to tie into some existing grades. But by having um, the uh, a more, I guess, by having a more resilient um, elevation to this property and by increasing um, pervious surfaces on this property, it's already creating um, greater infiltration and um, more of a vegetated barrier to coastal, uh, coastal storms as well. Um, one thing that I guess I'll note really quickly is the um, proposed visitor center which is um, this purple building over here. And that is, um, it's proposed and it's outside of resource areas in this proposed location, but it will be uh, potentially subject to coastal storm flooding in the future. Uh, Laura, before you go past this one, are those colors reversed on that map? Because the, the 0.5 is like all the way up on Merrimack Street. Yeah, point, um, point 0.5 foot of flooding. So um, basically what this means is- um, Oh, that's how much flooding. Flood. Yes, sorry. Okay. Yep, All yep. Right. Your greatest floods will be up near the river. Yeah. Okay. In this cross section, you can see down here, I'll just show where this cross section is displayed. Um, this is showing the fill depth that will be added to the site, again, um, in an effort to make it more resilient and um, considerable amount of fill um, that will provide a greater barrier to coastal, form, coastal storm um, floods in the future. Um, at, at this step in particular, we're adding four and a half feet in elevation. And here you can see a uh, sort of existing proposed same slide, uh, just to again showcase the uh, removal of impervious and um, addition of green space, which will um, obviously assist in um, infiltration and uh, adding to um, a barrier to coastal storm, coastal storms. Um, and I think the um, the other thing, well, I don't have the resource areas on this part, but we'll I'll, uh, hopefully that's in another slide. Because I think what I'd like to to show you too is that um, much of this existing impervious is actually within the riverfront area. So a lot of the removal is within the riverfront area as well, which runs sort of along this this line here. In addition to uh, just a general increase in green space, there will be an extensive landscaping plan that um, is in the NOI. And that includes landscape enhancement, naturalization of the property, but also uh, all native species, which will be an asset to um, habitat value on this property. And um, I'm just going to sort of glaze over this in the interest of time, but um, definitely can answer any specific questions on the proposed planting plan and the array of species that are proposed here, um, if the commission has any questions on it. As you can see, it's a, a thorough mix. This is the only building that's proposed on the property, which is the visitor center. And again, it's outside resource areas, but um, because we have the potential for it being within a coastal storm, a, a coastal storm flooded area in the future, um, the, the building itself will be made at a, um, at a um, <clears throat> resilient finished floor elevation and also have um, the ability to raise it. It's sort of a structure that can be raised um, as needed in the future. So um, it will have some features that will provide resiliency for that building itself. 
and just some renderings to show what the image here or the um, the goal, the um, what the um, what the sense of the property is go what the team is going for with this property as far as recreational value and um, ADA compliance, all of these walkways will um, provide gathering space and um, a, a, be a benefit to the surrounding community. This is a bit, a little bit redundant, but just to show that um, the, the building again is not only outside the um, existing coastal floodplain, um, but also outside the, um, this is the FEMA, you know, the um, aerial um, image of, of the, that FEMA uses, which is what's used for um, building permits. So it's, it's outside that um, as well. Um, so just a, a quick overview on the work. Um, first, the existing uh, pavement and structure that there, that's there will be demolished. There is a small area of contamination that is currently um, regulated under an AUL, or the property has an AUL on the deed. So the um, management of that soil will be conducted in line with that AUL and uh, moved off site um, as necessary. Um, then the fill will be added to the property. There will be pathway and plaza construction that will uh, cross the property in various places. And then along with that, utilities and stormwater infrastructure will be added. And uh, the parking lot will be reconfigured as you saw in the rendering. And um, the building will be constructed for the visitor center. And then finally, the landscaping construction will occur. And I think the, um, the schedule is actually touched on by Annie in the beginning as far as when the work will be conducted, but it's not anticipated until next year. Yeah, if I, Laura, if I could just uh, one comment for the commission members, um, and I'm not sure, I think we have a slide to this in the presentation, but we're doing the first phase is actually the primary park spaces um, based on available funding. Our plan is to build the primary park spaces, the bones of that park. Um, there'll be some site amenities added in there. Um, and then the parking areas would be a second phase, including some of the landscaping that goes in or around those areas. Um, we're trying to do what we can in phase one with the available budget. Uh, and then phase three would be the building. It's uh, expected to be funded with an entirely separate source of funds. And the timeline of that one is not exactly clear yet. Uh, so I have a question about the soil remediation area. Um, in other projects along the waterfront, we've run into much more contaminated soil than was originally thought mm -hmm. um, and held the project up a significant amount of time. Is, are you sure this is a small area and what's your plan if it isn't? Uh, well, I don't know if the Sasaki VHB team wants to speak to it, but we did bring an LSP on uh, under contract. That's part of their scope is to help us minimize the amount of excavation. Uh, we can't, of course, um, predict, you know, something that's unforeseen, so to speak. Um, but there is a fair amount of data that was available from prior testing um, on this site uh, as a base for us. So and we also did some borings for the building and swing set uh, areas. So, uh, so our hope is that we're minimizing based on the design only to the excavation trenches and things like that that we need to do. Um, keeping as much material on site and only disposing of that which we have to um, but again it's uh, you can't predict everything but we've tried to do as thorough as we can uh, and working with VHB as uh, as our sub consultant um, trying to minimize the amount of excavation uh, recognizing the environmental constraints that are there today in the OAL and the documentation that goes with that um, one, one question I have and this is a perfect angle to to attack it from um, so the walkways it, this from this picture, it looks like the walkways are lower than the berm. Um, is that going to be true? I, you know, I'm concerned if if a storm comes in that the water just comes down the walkways. 
Yeah, like VHB, we want to speak to this, but uh, keep in mind that, and this is not necessarily different than other areas you've heard about along the waterfront where we talk about resiliency, but um, this site does need to meet existing grades on the fringes uh, and also in the middle where it meets the waterfront trust property. Um, so uh, we aren't necessarily proposing to add significant fill to this site to bring everything up. Um, so it, it is actually, the walkway is a little lower than that berm area, which we brought up to roughly the same height as the existing berm. Um, so folks have a lawn to sit up on, but to your point, um, we've tried to raise up areas that we can, uh, you know, towards the middle of the site without actually um, creating ADA issues and so forth at the fringes of the property. Okay, just just so want all the water to come flowing in and have yeah no the to go out. Yeah, please note, by the way, and uh, I don't know uh, how recently some of you have heard about this or have looked at the details, but the bulkhead project also includes uh, raising the cap of that uh, bulkhead wall up to roughly the height of the wooden block seating that you see today. Um, so that is also intended to help with the resiliency in the future flood levels. Um, obviously, there are some openings in there that would have to be dealt with. And as I mentioned, no matter which site we're working with now or someone else is working with along the waterfront, you're going to have the edges of the property that they don't necessarily control uh, that they're going to have to meet in some way. Um, so um, but with that in mind, we are doing what we can as a as a phased approach here to um, to protecting the park space as well as the, the boardwalk as best we can. Okay, I just wanted it on the radar. Sorry, one thing I would add to that, that I, I don't know if this is at any more comfort level to you, but one of the things that Jordy and I had worked on with the uh, structural engineer for the bulkhead project is looking at um, longer term resiliency, even now, you know, beyond 2070 or 2100, let's say, um, there's the expectation that we would essentially build on top of the structure that's there today. So we would essentially remove the wooden decking, go down to concrete and steel um, that's, that's salvageable. We might have to reconstruct uh, portions of that depending on corrosion, uh, but basically building on top of the cells that are there today, uh, the, the steel cells that are uh, supporting the boardwalk. Um, and by protecting it with the concrete and the FRP, fiberglass reinforced panels that are in that project. Um, our plan is long term, really, I think, is to protect the park, not by raising the park so much, but actually by raising the outside edge, um, possibly the, the boardwalk itself uh, in the future. So, um, you know, it is that we are thinking about those things. And I would say it's cost prohibitive, probably for us to raise everything up right now, um, maybe to, to that higher degree, but we are planning for those things and trying to do it in a reasonably phased way based on the available funding. Okay, thank you. Great, I'll just jump into the last the last bit here. Um, so the just a brief run through of um, regulatory compliance. I think the, um, the 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 highlights are the um, the buffer zone will be greatly improved by all of the uh, additional green space. The riverfront area, same same sort of story, a good story, where um, the existing impervious that's within the riverfront area will be removed or decreased substantially, and um, the uh, landscaped area will provide a great enhancement and improvement to um, what's now degraded riverfront area. Um, land subject to coastal storm flowage um, under the bylaw. Just want to mention there we're not in a V zone, and um, <clears throat> there's no um, really habitat value to this area in existing condition. Um, it will actually be improved by this moving forward. Mitigation measures, the um, just, uh, sort of your standard ENS measures um, with uh, per perimeter controls, contra construction entrances, and also um, silt sacks or catch basin protection. Um, the tree protection, there will be 46 trees that will be saved as the uh, work is done. And so those um, trees will have tree protection measures around them. That concludes the main um, presentation. We can um, take any more questions if you have them here. Um, and um, like I said, the team is here if, if we need to rely on their expertise. Okay. Anyone from the commission or Julie? I just have a question about um, timing, and I know you said you want to try and start this next spring, but if that and if that takes place, which would be great, um, 
how long do you see this construction period lasting for the two, um, you know, the main elements that would take place in this phase one? Um, Mara, do you want to speak to that at all? We're trying to do as much as we can, obviously, in the first season there, um, based on my experience locally uh, at the municipal level, I would say that there's a possibility of some of that extending, you know, just based on um, the unusual things that, you know, folks can encounter during uh, construction or bidding. Um, but our plan is to bid over the winter and construct this uh, next year. We still have to talk a little bit about the phasing in order to limit impacts uh, to parking in the, the central waterfront public access. Um, but Marin, do you or is anyone else in your team able to speak to that further? Yes, we are anticipating uh, that construction for phase one would go through mid-June of 2024. Oh, mid through mid-June of 2024. So you begin it, you begin construction next spring, so spring of 2023, mm -hmm. and it would take, a, it would go for a year? Yes, that's what we're estimating right now. And this is just for the land, essentially just the landscape work, this is not constructing the, not constructing the building, but the the pathways, the landscaping, the grading, um, all the other site amenities. Would, would yeah, be. Laura, so if you flip, I think it might be the first slide in the appendix. We have a phasing plan, here we go. So that's phase one. So that includes all of the historic ways um, and several of the plazas, including the swing structures and uh, seating areas and sculptural elements. I guess the, you know the reason why I'm asking, obviously, is because it's such a heavily used part of the city, especially during the spring, summer, and early fall months. And um, I'm just wondering if there's been any, and I, you know, I apologize, Andy, if we've talked about this in the office, but and I don't remember, but if there's been any discussion about how to um, how to handle public access and use. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Julia. Um, I know, I think we might have touched on it briefly, but we have been thinking about that. Uh, we've been focused primarily in recent months, obviously on the uh, park design, but we're starting to get now into the discussion, uh, which will involve more heavily city officials at this point, um, but the phasing side of it. So working with the parking clerk, um, you know, with the waterfront trust and, and, you know, thinking about the activities that are down there, uh, maintaining uh, electrical, for instance, you know, looking at those issues where we're, we're considering those things very heavily because we obviously don't want to impact um, not of the pedestrians, but also the vehicles that have to park down there to the extent we can um, flip sides of construction one side or the other um, and work with the parking clerk. Um, it is going to be a little bit more complicated because of its, um, you know, location right downtown uh, in a primary area um, during the peak season. This isn't uh, the bulkhead project. I think, you know, can be constructed over the winter, which is great. Um, but um, unfortunately, this one can't be. So, um, so to your point, we will be working more with city officials to develop a phasing plan and working closely with the contractor to try to minimize uh, issues during the next season, assuming that, you know, we'll still have, you know, pedestrian traffic to the waterfront. Where is the construction lay down area going to be? Right. Well, that's actually, Steve, that's actually one of the things we need to discuss. So again, as we've been finalizing the plans for construction, we're now getting into that level of detail that has to be in, uh, at least as a basic uh, phasing plan, our bid set. So one of the things we will be talking about with the parking clerk, with the Department of Public Services and others here is in the Waterfront Trust, for instance, is where do we lay down equipment, um, both on this site, is anything stored elsewhere during construction to try to maximize the parking that's remaining, um, you know, for, for folks down here. But um, that's a juggling act, and it's going to require some input from other city officials before we can determine that exact but keep in mind that the the uh, phase two gravel or parking areas that you see today are essentially going to be shrunk gravel areas, um, but um, not necessarily with the edge, all the edge plantings that you see. So that, you know, Mayor mentioned on this plan here, we see the phase one and phase two. So the landscaping that's on the phase two may not all be there. So there'll be a little bit, um, you know, possibly a few more cars that could fit in there, thereby allowing more staging. But at the same time, um, we do need to minimize that to your point. So we have to flush those details out, talking with some other city officials before we can be specific about where that will go. And the, the access to the boardwalk through the waterfront trust land will not be impeded during this construction? I mean, uh, there are short points where we're making a connection to the pedestrian path, but that's relatively minimal. Um, you know, 
the, the beginning and the end, you know, of the, uh, the west side there where the sculpture park is, uh, there will be some improvements being done in there. But again, we can work with the contractor to phase so that the access points elsewhere are maintained. So again, that's a detail we have to walk through, but we have every intention of maintaining public access uh, to the boardwalk and to the primary park space um, in the center there throughout construction um, with a few exceptions where there's say some, you know, heavy utility work or something that might be, um, you know, not safe for the public, but work around events schedule and whatnot. So um, we, we fully understand that concern and we support, um, you know, minimizing the impact as much as possible. There may be one of those connecting ways, the so-called Ferry Wharf Way, for instance, you know, may not be there at some point um, during construction, but then when it's added, it may allow us to offset another area um, and loop folks around. They may not take directly the same route they would take along the boardwalk temporarily for a week or so, um, but that's uh, a short jog, so to speak, that we're trying to basically accomplish that by rerouting folks around uh, an area. There's very minimal work that has to be done, um, you know, directly on the boardwalk itself, and so it's really the sculpture part and the two integration points uh, where it meets the central embayment. Um, but that being said, we're going to work to phase uh, the staging areas and the con contractor activities to minimize its impact on the public so they can still maintain the public access and enjoy that next season, even though we're building uh, the bigger park. Okay. Do we have anything else? Just going to point out that there is an underutilized parking garage, brand new, right down the street. So if anyone's concerned about parking, we certainly have that uh, <laughs> to point to. That is correct. Point. Any other comments or questions from us? No, I, I just I share the same concern Joe has about the you know, the openings that are going to allow flood water in, even though there's a berm, right? I guess there's not much we can do because you have to meet the existing grades of other landowners, but it, it just seems like we need to do something there. Well, I was thinking about that, Steve, and, and it, you know, this actually sort of makes it easier to, in the future, we can make connections to that, to that berm if these are narrower, um, you know, pathways that, that can be accommodated, I, I think it's sort of a step in the right direction because the sea level rise will occur over a long period of time, you know, so that you can have this in place and then as need be, you could, you could fill that in. I mean, the water's going to come around the sides anyway. Um, right. So, you know, if you burn this entire stretch, it's still going to sneak its way in there uh, on either end, but. It, it it's get, gets closer to building some sort of a contiguous berm structure. Yeah. Yeah. Adaptable. Yep. All right. Uh, you have anything else before I ask the public? No. All right. Uh, anything from the public? Raise your digital hand if you would like to ask something or say something. Well, seeing none. Um, no one cares about the waterfront. <laughs> clearly no one cares about it or everybody loves it. So it's. We, we've had plenty of public meetings on the, on the projects. I wouldn't necessarily say that. <laughs> it may just be that folks uh, don't necessarily see this as a, uh, Wellens protection problem, more so a benefit, but uh, I hope that's the case. Are you saying they just don't? You saying they just don't care about us, Andy? <laughs> no, not at all. No, just that this is very consistent with your notable um, and very noble goals. <laughs> oh wow! Yes. <laughs> all right then. Um, do I'll we have a motion? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All right, uh, roll call. Uh, Charlie Lovasetti? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Thank you for all your hard work, folks. Fun. Thank you. Um, could you, uh, Julia, would you mind, and I don't know if, uh, Joe, you could speak to this at all, but just for the consultant's benefit, because they're not as quite as familiar with our commission's way of uh, 
proceeding with hearings. Just clarifying how you uh, would handle the further review or issuance of conditions at this point. I know some boards will do a hearing and, and address that right at the tail end. I know you type to you tend to do that at the end of your meeting. I just want to make sure the consultants understood that. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're uh, that'll be one of our next things to do, if not our next thing to do. But I, I can say that when we when we get to that point, um, when the orders of conditions are taken up for vote, um, we typically refer back to conditions that were discussed during the hearing, which was just closed, and um, and those are the special conditions that get incorporated into the order itself. So um, you've probably heard if there are any major concerns and things that would get incorporated, you've already heard that. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that we had a lot, but at least I, from our end. I didn't, note, I didn't note any special conditions beyond our standard ones for a project like this. So um, Okay, very good. All right, uh, can I get a motion to close the public hearings? So moved. Uh, Second. Okay, me is that too. Um, roll call, Charlie Lovacetti? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Uh, Dan Warshaw? Yes. And I vote yes. All right, um, why don't we, let's go to uh, enforcements and violations first. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Hold on a sec here. Okay. Uh, next is 150 Northern Boulevard. Yes. Right. Okay. So 150 Northern Boulevard. And we have um, Mr. Muratore. I'm going to promote also to a panelist. So he'll be able to talk about this is his, pro his property and his project um, at 150 Northern Boulevard. This is a um, aerial photograph of the site prior to construction. Um, and according to Mr. Muratore, there he lives in Florida most of the year and hired a contractor to repave or resurface the existing driveway and parking areas and put in a patio, um, which he was unaware that there were regulations prohibiting this type of thing. So in any case, um, this is a photograph of what went in. Um, Mr. Muratori, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correct. You can maybe speak to what took place out here. Uh, and make sure you unmute yourself too. Unmute yourself. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's like Julia said, um, it's our summer home. We owned it probably about 12 years. And I wanted to re-rock the front of it, the parking areas on both sides. And then we thought about putting a, a uh, flat patio in. I had no idea we needed to get permission to do it. I did hire a contractor who's done work in the area. And I thought for sure he would tell me if I needed permits or okays. He did it. Um, I know I'm still responsible and I know ignorance is not an excuse for any of this, but I honestly didn't know. The question I did ask him is what he was using for fill. I wanted to make sure that it was rock and sand and there was no other elements in it. And that was pretty much it. We just wanted, cause we're on a corner. So we have a deck in the front of our house we sit out on. But a lot of times it's just so busy there. We were looking for a little bit of privacy around that backside of the house. So that's what we did. Um, as you can see that the whole front, if you're looking, was, uh, oh, here we go, was rocked before and we did add the patio and we put added rock to the back of the patio that goes up to um, like a little wild, I would say garden that we have back there. Vegetation. Vegetation, thank you. And I think you yeah. sent me, um, Gary, I think you sent me also a, um let's see a, a sketch yeah this is the sketch yeah. that you sent okay so right. this is what it was this was what was done correct that's it exactly <clears throat> so was that what well, we just saw that picture that showed the um patio there is 
what is the it doesn't look like sand that's in front that Julie. was that was that picture was taken i apologize that picture was taken before it was done construction this this was done we got a call from somebody out there on the island saying there's work taking place on this property we don't think they have a permit i drove out there sure enough um this was all sort of being dug up um, and the patio was being put in. So this was during construction. I went back the next day and it was, it's pea stone all around here. So they just really resurfaced with gravel, pea stone, the driveway in the front and in the back. And it was really this patio that was the piece that was um, a violation of the regs. Okay. And so I, I issued a notice of violation and I, because um, the property owner wasn't there at the time and I was having difficulty communicating with the contractor. I had to, I didn't know what else to do. So that's why I issued the notice of violation. I brought it over um, and, or actually I sent, I think I sent it certified to the property owner, Mr. Murtori, and, mm -hmm. and he called me right away and then we've got, and then I spoke with him about it and he explained what happened and he put together this sketch for us to see what was done um, as opposed to the existing conditions. And then also talked about wanting to put a fence in to separate the drive area from sort of more like the private area in the back. Um, and he provided a sketch of the, or a photograph of the type of fence that they would like to use which would be something that would be compliant, something like this with an mm -hmm. opening at the bottom. Um, so it would be, you know, consistent with Hong Kong regs. Can I ask a question about that opening? Yeah. Um, sure. I, I know you told me I need two feet, but if we have a dog, we'd like to try to keep in the yard. Is there something we could do? Can we bring the pickets down or is there, because again, if we do anything, I want to check with you first. I've, Learn. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty common question that we get. And, um, and there are ways to do it. It's not, you know, none of this is simple or and it's all a little bit cumbersome. And, um, but you can use, but you can use sort of like a, a chicken wire at the bottom two feet. You can have okay. every other picket come down. It depends on how big your dog is, obviously. Some people have really small uh, dogs. It's just a little, little guy. Yeah. So, um, then you kind of have to get creative with that while maintaining that openness factor. So I, I, I think I sent you our fence guidelines, which do provide some you examples did, uh -huh. of other people have done that. Um, yeah. But you can always send yeah, me another okay. sketch of what you propose and let me in one. Okay. I mean, the chicken wire is fine. We would love to do something like that. And we can definitely put chicken wire around the bottom if that's And the then you way. can plant things in front of it too to, to uh -huh. screen the you know, the perp here. Right, absolutely. So um, if we could go back and look at one of the, yeah, that. Um, the area that's been untouched, I, I don't know if it's the side or the back of the house. Oh, yeah, right. What What is currently there for vegetation? Grass. Uh, grass and weeds. This, this area right here. Oh, there we go, yeah. Okay. So it's, Sort of unmanicured, sort of politely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we hadn't been there in two years. <laughs> yeah. um, looks, better, looks better than my yard, so. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> I feel better. So um, I don't know what we want to do to either say, you know, the patio has to go or say, Maybe uh, it's okay, but the, 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 what shall we say, unmanicured lawn needs to be mitigation for and put in beach grass or, or native shrubs or, or something. Bold. Or bold. Uh, that I would, would be I would, fun. Yeah, I would prefer a lot of mitigation for this. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, well, that's what we wanted to do. Um, between COVID and I had some health problems last year, so we weren't able to go down at all. And the year prior, we were actually selling our residents in Western Mass. So we spent like maybe a week there. So this was the year where we 
really like, okay, we get a whole summer. And my wife ended up having to be in Florida most of the summer. So I was there alone. I just wanted to try to get some stuff done, but I definitely wanted to do something here. Like I said, I had neighbors coming over going, oh, compared to what it looked like, it's so nice. Thank you. You made the whole street look, you know, much better. And, so that- and it does look nice. And I had no idea that we couldn't put, I thought that was probably the best thing in the world to do, not knowing anything. Obviously, just a nice little flat. It was bluestone. I didn't think much of it at all. Now I realize I would never do it again. But So that vegetation that's <clears throat> in the back um, that you see just looks like bushes. Yeah. It's really just weeds. So what we would like to do is kind of clear that out and put some landscaping in there. Okay, but it looks like it extends over into the neighbor's yard. Uh, uh, they and, also have. So yeah, it's, I think it comes on both sides and kind yeah. of just grows over the fence. Well, I, I said can give you... That far. I can give you a plant list of native plant plants that are native to Plum Island involves grasses, shrubs, trees, what, whatnot. I mean, there's a, it's a pretty extensive Perfect. list, but any of those, if you cho chose from that list and you planted and the commission can tell you, you know, how much extensive area of planting they'd like to see. Um, yeah, that would be great. Choose from that list. That would be great because we do want to do something with it. It does look terrible. And getting a list of what can go there, what helps the environment the best, we would love to do. We really would. And then on the sketch, I don't know if you can see, but so from that corner post of the fence that you were just on, um, we just kind of wanted to bring that fence like to the house to enclose that backside because of oh, the traffic. Right yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Just for the dog's safety um, mm -hmm. because of the traffic on Northern Boulevard. Yeah, he almost got killed a couple of weeks ago. He, He's just a puppy. Yeah. And he takes <laughs> off a lot. So. It's like, okay, time to, we got to either keep them tied up, which I really don't want to do at all, or, you know, we got to put a fence up. I say tied up, I mean inside the house and on a leech all the time out. It says no running, I don't really tie them up outside. What's the square footage of the uh, paver patio? 14 by 14. Okay. Um, so would you be willing to take your unmanicured lawn and make all of that native vegetation? I, absolutely. absolutely. We were, we've were we been talking about doing that anyway. So okay. it's, yeah. it's probably that little push I need right now to do it, you guys. But well, we I the think it would look great. Everything. Yeah. We'll make it a big push. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> do, you, do, you happen yeah. to know what the, do you happen to know what the square footage is of that? that area that uh, the, the no lawn area that. that would be replanted? I really have no clue. Yeah, the, the patio is about 200 square feet. Yeah, there you go, so. You guys want to say like a two to one ratio of mitigation? That, or... that's, what, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. No, I, it, look, it, it looks like it'll, you, you've got close to that. I don't want to lock us into that if you don't have two to one. It'd be nice to know how what the square footage is of the the area that that can be used for remediation. Okay, um, I should be back there at some point this weekend. I'm in Florida right now. Um, so we can. Uh, yeah, what I'll if try you to... were to What if you were to take a look when, when you get back there and, um, mm -hmm. and and like you've sketched this out right here, which is really helpful. If you were to sketch out again on this plan, the area of planting mitigation plantings that you would be able to install, and then you could send it back to us and the commission could take a look at it. Sure, I'd be more than happy to do that. And then it would be something that they could have and they could see, make, you know, check on, make sure that it got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you, all, if you also have, I was gonna say, if you also have a list of landscapers along with that list of plants, that would be helpful. <laughs> Yeah, don't we don't we aren't able to <laughs> recommend, but there's plenty around, maybe. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we can check around our neighbors. And, and yeah. also, if they did a landscaping plan for you, they would they would need to know square footages and all that too. If, if yeah, you they could submit it to you. And that would show us, you know, the area that you're going to be uh, 
doing and how many square feet and everything. Okay. Yeah, I will. I'll make some calls Monday and hopefully get them down as soon as I can. And when I can get a plan, I'll, uh, I'll send it right over to, to Julia. If that's okay. okay. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> So can we get that by our next meeting, do you think, in two weeks? Oh, absolutely. I'll make calls. I, guess I can make calls next Monday. I'll be back at some point this week. I think we're flying in late Friday night or Saturday morning. We'll get there because we're going to go stop to see one of our daughters and grandkids. And then um, I will I'll make calls Monday, try to get whoever can do it first to come in and give me a plan. Okay. okay. And on then, and I can show it to the commission at the next meeting, which is our August 16th meeting, and they can okay. give it their stamp. Yeah, it should be done well before that. Okay. I'm hoping. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very All much. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. okay. Thank you, Julie. All right. On to. Orders of conditions. Well, uh, before we leave this, uh, okay. What about our encroachment on Cooper North? <clears throat> what's what's happening with that? Um, oh, the encroachment on Cooper North. Well, okay, we did. We had a meeting. This was like maybe two weeks ago. A meeting with the mayor um, and Andy um, and Jordy, and we explained the whole situation to them and. We also had communicated with Essex County Greenbelt about it and they suggested that the city needs to handle it first and the city can't handle it, then essentially Essex County Greenbelt has to do sort of enforcement on the city. So it's the city's job to reach out to those property owners at, I believe it's 16 and 17 Dover Run Drive and let them know of the violation. Um, they asked, the mayor's office asked if I would draft those letters, which I did and forwarded them to um, the mayor's assistant because it does need to come from the administration. Um, it's not a wetlands issue. So it's a property, it's a city property infringement issue. So um, that's that's the last move I made on it. Um, I can check in with the mayor's office tomorrow and see if, there, if there's been any follow up on their end. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see them get pushed a little. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Oh, oh, you can also ask the mayor's office uh, where they are with uh, with um, someone, you know, another uh, commission member too, because yeah. I, I see that at least one person has not heard anything back from. Uh, okay, okay, I will do that too. Yeah, because I know that there have been at least one or two um, applications that have come in for that, so we should. Uh, I forgot um, if you don't mind reminding me. What were the encroachments out there again? Was there a shed or was it cutting? I, I don't remember. Well, there was cutting, there was a shed and a fire pit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So a, a variety of incidents. Yes. Um, all right, so next one. What are the conditions? Um, Arthur and Sandy Manley, 257, 259 Water Street. Um, did we have any, uh, we didn't have any special conditions, right? No. Uh, just a planting plan, I think. That's right, wait, I did, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I did write, I did mention that. Um, yes, there is a special condition, which is that prior to issuance of an occupancy permit, a landscape plan showing um, plantings of shrubs and or um, native species with pollinator value shall be provided um, covering an area equivalent to the square footage of the removal of the structures removed, i.e. the shed and deck and entry landing. So I'll, you know, I'll make that sound a little bit more clean, but. Okay. Got a motion? Uh, motion to issue your conditions for 257, 259 Water Street. Second. 
Uh, roll call, Charlie Olovasetti. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. And I vote yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next one uh, is City of Newbury Report, 24 Merrimack Street. And we had no special conditions for that, right? No, but I, I mean, I would say that we should ask for the construction staging plan um, prior to the start of construction at a minimum. Prior that we should have the construction staging plan and the um, construction, what was the other one? Or sequencing? And, and phasing, yeah, sequencing yeah. plan. So Julia, is it in our standard orders um, about the refueling of, of equipment, you know, near or, or away yep. from the water and all that? Yep, no, no refueling or storage of fuels within the buffer zone, um, all the storage of that type of, I, I, you know, I can't remember the exact wording, but we have like at least one special condition, if not more um, in our standard conditions about refueling and storage of, of fuels and hazardous materials and things like that. Okay. Um, obviously erosion, I mean, they've provided, they've provided some erosion control details, but the construction staging plan should include, you know, final erosion controls. And if they need a stormwater pollution prevention plan, we should get a copy. I Julie, I think I'd like to add something, and I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I guess it would come up anyway, but just to sort of dot our I's and cross our T's, if they do encounter more contaminated soil than they plan for, I'd like to have them come back and discuss with us the plan for how they're going to manage that. Um, I'm sure their LSP will, well, is has to go according to the MCP, but we'd like to be involved in that too, or informed of it. Okay. How about, and, and I think that's excellent. Um, we should definitely do that because that could easily happen. So what if we ask for, um, in the event that any contaminated soils are encountered and need to be um, managed on site and disposed of and or disposed of, um, the commission shall be notified in writing. Yeah, I mean, their LSP should be providing a report of, it, of any of that yeah. anyway, so maybe if we could just be copied on that, but anything okay. beyond what they expect, because um, as Steve mentioned, it, it could be extensive. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to write beyond, like beyond what's expected, because <laughs> what's that threshold, you know, what's right. expected and what's not. So I almost feel like we should just be, we should just be copied on the reports uh, of you know any contamination on site. Yeah, well, yeah, that would cover everything, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, sounds okay. good. I like it. That way we'll be aware because even if it's a little, we're going to want to know if they're stockpiling out there for how long it's going to be stockpiled, where when it's going to be removed. You know, that's a good. I mean, they really should know what's out there because when they had that plan to build buildings out there, they did a whole bunch of borings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but look what happened with the area in front of the wastewater treatment plant. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There could be pockets of stuff that you just missed, you know? Oh, believe me. I, 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 I was, I retired from a lab that had lots of radioactive contamination in the back that was remit, remit, whatever it is, uh, Idiated. taken care of, uh, I don't know, four or five times while I worked there. And then when they went to build a new building, they had to take out a whole ton more. So yeah, that, that stuff does happen. Um, Andy, did you have a comment? Uh, no, I, I would say it's fine. It makes sense to provide the commission with the uh, the reports. And I think it was, it was noted, or at least hinted at earlier, the state has protocols that the LSP and our contractors are gonna to need to follow. Um, that's why we have the LSP under contract during construction as well. So, um, you know, we obviously we can provide those reports to you and let you know, obviously, whether it's the initial quantity or some additional quantity that if we discover anything beyond that we have to deal with, um, let you know how we're dealing with it. Andy, do you, uh, yeah, I guess. 
Okay. All right. We good? Motion. Motion to issue the order of conditions for 24 Merrimack Street. I'll second. Uh, roll call. Uh, Charlie Al Alovacetti? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Ann Warshall? Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Um, next. CPC member. Uh, Community Preservation Committee. Um, I am fine with doing it for now. If uh, you folks are okay with it. You sound so <laughs> fine. <laughs> I know. Well, I don't see anybody interrupting me. So, um, so we'll, we'll do this like when I took over the chairmanship. I'll, uh, I won't step back. If, if Carol um, or David decide they, they would like to do it, then we can, uh, we can send them. But uh, I They think can submit their application. They can so they submit can their them. application that uh, I will greedily look at and uh, forward to the commission. Um, but I think we probably need to vote on it. Um, so can you, vote for your, can you vote for yourself? Oh yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't really need to, I could, because there's four of us, if, if three say yes, then it's official anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'd make a motion to, uh, appoint Joe as the interim uh, CPC member from the Conservation Commission. Second. Roll call. Charlie Lovacetti? Yes. Uh, Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. And I am present. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Julie, you want to send that off to the mayor's office? I shall. Yep. Thank you. Uh, what else? Was there something else? Oh, I uh, won't be here next meeting. Yeah. Hey, Andy, is, is Andy still here? No, he's already gone. Um, yeah, Steve will not, be, I mean, Joe will not be here next meeting. Steve, will you be here the next meeting? I should be, yes. 16th. Okay, so you'll be chair on the 16th. And neither Joe or I will be here on September 6th, I believe. Is it the 6th? Um, yes, yeah, so September 6th is the uh, primary election, and I am uh, officially apparently a poll worker, so I will be working the polls. Um, I will be hiking a mountain in Switzerland. Oh, I'm not gonna. Right. I'm not gonna zoom in. No, it's only six hours time difference. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you well know. So. Um, so I'll have to talk to Andy about managing the Zoom piece of it. And then Steve, do you mind if you're, are you gonna be here for the 6th of September? I believe I am. I'm probably gonna miss the next meeting though. Okay. Oh, oh the okay. next meeting's the one I'm not at. September 6th, I think I'm here. So why don't we do this? I will send out an email to the whole commission tomorrow and just get everyone, get a tally of who's available at what, at what meeting. Okay. Oh, no, yeah, I'm not here at the six. Sorry. I'm not here at the next two meetings. Never mind. Okay. So then we can, I'll, I'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. We'll, yeah. We'll get okay. it. Very good. Do we have anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call. Charlie Lovis. Yes. Seymour. <laughs> yes. Let me finish asking the question. <laughs> Dan Warshaw. <laughs> yes. And I say yes. See you in a month and a half or so. Good night, right. everyone. See ya. Have a good, good night. One. Good night. Thank you.